Hi, this is Tom from zerodefinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through kidney stones. And you can find written notes on this topic at zerodefinals.com slash kidney stones or in the urology section of the Zero Finals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. Kidney stones are also referred to as renal calculi, urolithiasis and nephrolithiasis. They're hard stones that form in the renal pelvis, where the urine collects before it travels down the ureters. Kidney stones may be asymptomatic until they irritate or they get stuck in the ureters. They might get stuck at any point along the ureters, but most often this happens at the vesico-ureteric junction, which is the junction between the ureter and the bladder. There are two key complications to kidney stones. The first is obstruction, which can lead to an acute kidney injury because urine can't drain away from the kidney, and so there's back pressure into the kidney affecting the function. And the second is infection, with obstructive pyelonephritis, or infection in the kidney caused by obstruction, so that infective matter builds up in the kidney tissue. Let's talk about the types of kidney stones. Calcium-based stones are the most common type of kidney stone, and this accounts for about 80% of kidney stones. Having a raised serum calcium level, or hypercalcemia, and a low urine output are key risk factors for calcium collecting into a stone. There are two types of calcium stones, calcium oxalate, which is the more common type, and calcium phosphate stones. The other types of kidney stones include uric acid stones, and uric acid stones are not visible on x-rays, struvite stones, and struvite is a chemical that's produced by bacteria, and these are associated with infection, and cysteine stones, and these are associated with cysteinuria, which is an autosomal recessive disease. Next let's talk about staghorn calculus. A staghorn calculus is where the stone forms into the shape of the renal pelvis, giving it a similar appearance to the antlers on a deer stag. The body of the staghorn calculus sits in the renal pelvis, with the horns extending into the renal calyces. A staghorn calculus may be seen on plain x-ray films. Most commonly, this occurs with stones made of struvite. In patients with recurrent upper urinary tract infections, the bacteria can hydrolyze the urea, which is found in the urine, into ammonia, and this creates the solid struvite. Let's talk about the presentation of kidney stones. Renal stones may be asymptomatic and never cause any issues. A symptom called renal colic is the presenting complaint in symptomatic kidney stones. Renal colic is unilateral loin-to-groin pain, which can be excruciating, and some people describe it as worse than childbirth. And it's colicky, meaning that it fluctuates in severity as the stone moves and settles in position. Patients with renal colic often move restlessly due to the pain. They may also experience hematuria, or blood in the urine, nausea and vomiting, reduced urine output, and symptoms of sepsis if infection is present. Let's talk about the investigations. A urine dipstick test usually shows hematuria, or blood in the urine, in cases of kidney stones. A normal urine dipstick does not exclude kidney stones. Urine dipsticks are also helpful to exclude infection. Blood tests can help establish signs of infection and also the kidney function. Checking the serum calcium helps identify hypercalcemia, or a raised calcium level, which may have been the cause of the kidney stones. An abdominal x-ray can show calcium-based stones, but uric acid stones will not show up. They are radiolucent, meaning that they don't show up on x-rays. A non-contrast computer tomography, or CT scan, of the kidneys, ureters and bladder, which is called a CTKUB, is the initial investigation of choice for diagnosing kidney stones. The NICE guidelines from 2019 recommend a CTKUB within 24 hours of the presentation. An ultrasound of the kidneys, ureters and bladder, or an ultrasound KUB, 
is a less preferred alternative to a CT scan. A negative result does not exclude kidney stones. Ultrasound is less effective at identifying kidney stones, but it is helpful in pregnant women and children. Stones can be analysed to determine the type, which is useful to help establish the cause and reduce the risk of recurrence. A tom tip for you, remember hypercalcemia or a raised calcium level as a cause of kidney stones. You can remember the presenting features of hypercalcemia with the mnemonic renal stones, painful bones, abdominal groans and psychiatric moans. The three causes of hypercalcemia to remember are calcium supplements, hyperparathyroidism and cancer, for example myeloma, breast cancer or lung cancer. Let's talk about management. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the most effective type of analgesia, for example intramuscular or rectal diclofenac. IV paracetamol is an alternative where NSAIDs are not suitable. Opiates are not very helpful for pain management and they're not routinely used. Antiemetics are used to treat nausea and vomiting, for example metoclopramide, prochlorperazine or cyclozine. Antibiotics are required if infection is present. Watchful weighting is usually used in stones that are less than 5mm in size as there's a 50-80% to 80% chance that these will pass without any interventions. Watchful weighting may also be suitable for patients with stones that are 5-10mm to 10 millimeters depending on individual factors. It can take several weeks for the stones to pass. Tamzilosin, which is an alpha blocker, can be used to help aid the passage of stones. Surgical interventions are required for large stones, for example 10 millimeters or more, and also for stones that don't pass spontaneously or where there's complete obstruction or infection. So let's talk in more detail about the surgical options. First let's talk about extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, or ESWL. This involves an external machine that generates shockwaves and directs them at the stones under x-ray guidance. The shockwaves break the stone into smaller parts which makes it easier for them to pass. There's another surgical option called uretoscopy and laser lithotripsy and this involves a camera inserted via the urethra, bladder and ureter to identify the stone. The stone is then broken up using targeted lasers and the smaller pieces of stone are easier to pass. Another option is percutaneous nephrolithotomy and percutaneous nephrolithotomy is performed in theatres under a general anaesthetic. A nephroscope, which is a small camera on a stick, is inserted via a small incision in the patient's back. The scope is inserted through the kidney to assess the ureter. When stones are identified, tools can be used to break the stones into smaller pieces and remove them. A nephrostomy tube may be left in place after the procedure to help drain the kidney. The final surgical option is open surgery. An open surgical procedure can be used to access the kidneys and remove the stones. This is rarely needed as other less invasive methods are usually effective. Finally, let's talk about recurrent kidney stones. One episode of kidney stones predisposes patients to further episodes. The NICE guidelines from 2019 recommend advising patients to increase their oral fluid intake to 2.5 to 3 litres per day, add fresh lemon juice to water, and this is because citric acid binds to urinary calcium, reducing the formation of stones, avoid carbonated drinks, as cola drinks contain phosphoric acid, which promotes calcium oxalate formation and the development of stones, reduce dietary salt intake to less than 6 grams per day, and maintain a normal calcium intake in the diet. Interestingly, a low dietary calcium may increase the risk of kidney stones. 
Other common recommendations include for calcium stones, reducing the intake of oxalate rich foods, for example, spinach, beetroot, nuts, rhubarb, and black tea. For uric acid stones, reducing the intake of purine rich foods, for example, kidney, liver, anchovies, sardines, and spinach. And generally limiting the dietary protein intake. There are two medications that may be used to reduce the risk of recurrence of kidney stones, and these are potassium citrate, which is used in patients with calcium oxalate stones and a raised urinary calcium, and thiazide diuretics, for example in dapamide, and these are also used in patients with calcium oxalate stones and a raised urinary calcium. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked the video, left a comment or subscribe to the channel, thank you so much, it really helps. Zero to Finals is not just a YouTube channel, there's also a website with detailed notes, illustrations and questions, an Instagram account where new questions are posted every day to help you test your knowledge, books, flashcards and much more. I also have a personal channel where I share my thoughts and tips on learning medicine, and you can find links to everything in the description of this video. See you next time.